Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm happy to welcome you to Princeton Innovation Center Biolabs. My name is Michelle Romer. I am the events manager here. The entrepreneur's journey continues tonight with a second installment in the series, developing a pitch deck that supports your fundraising plan. I'm sure you will find it interesting and informative. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. For those in attendance, our guest Wi-Fi is welcome one with a cat one word with a cat, with a one on the number one at the end of the word welcome. And the bathrooms are located down the hall to the left. And now on with the program, I'm going to hand the mic over to Anne Marie Memon, Executive Director of the Princeton Entrepreneur. Uh, Princeton Entrepreneur. Oh, I can't say Entrepreneur. Don't feel bad. I, I do the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, Council at Princeton University. I do the same thing, so don't feel bad about it. Uh, try spelling it. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Michelle, for uh, for welcoming um, welcoming us here. Uh, thanks to the audience for being here. We have both an in person audience. We also have a, a virtual audience. Um, what we're how we're going to structure the conversation. This is uh, session two of our entrepreneurs' journey. Our entrepreneur is Mark Esposito. Um, and we wanna talk about the founding and the funding side. And our funder is Mike Wiley. Um, and they have known each other now for a number of years. They are, uh, Mike has funded Mark, um, but they've also done a lot of talking about what works well and at what stages. So I think what we're gonna do, how we're gonna start it off, I think will be useful to sort of ground the discussion will be for Mark to talk through as a founder, um, what he's learned. He has is in uh, raising a Series A right we're, now? We're through the A, we're okay. looking at a takeover soon. Okay, so he's finished his Series A and moving into a next round, um, a takeover? Uh, yeah, we think that somebody's gonna be buying the company. So. Okay, terrific, all right. So uh, a very exciting time, no wonder you're so busy. <laughs> Uh, so he has done his seed round and he's done his A round, different types of things. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about what didn't work and also what did work. Great. Thanks, everybody. Excited to be here for number two. It's been a blitz of a tour. Um, happy for this to be interactive. Uh, if people have specific questions, I might call out a few guinea pigs too, um, you know, sort of across the sectors that are here and, and happy to talk through some of those things. So the experience that we have is life science focused. Um, I think that some of the general principles that I'll go over um, go across multiple different companies and sectors. Uh, at this point, I've built pitch decks for four different companies, and I think that I'm close to 100% success rate on funding from those pitch decks. So I'm hoping to continue that success. Um, and with that, I think we covered most of the intro stuff. So, um, Neil, you've got questions on Zoom if they pop up? Okay, awesome. Okay, so right here, um, what I wanna chat about is first when you're raising money. So everybody I think is gonna go through this cycle. And this is a personal journey for everybody, but the most important thing is about how satisfied you are through the fundraising process. So what I've mapped here is just my general thoughts on it and how it worked out for me. I've seen this rhyme for many different entrepreneurs. So you start raising, you build your company, you build the pitch deck, everything, stuff's starting to get exciting. You do your technical research, like stuff is really exciting. It gets like, you get really amped when you chat with your friends, family, and mentors. They're like, yeah, this is a great idea. Go out, you know, you'll raise a ton of money, be a billionaire. You build the deck, maybe you get a license template from Princeton or whoever else. Um, you're on the top of the world. And then you send it out to um, you know, your corporate lawyers, maybe apply to i or SBIR. And at this point, like you're, you're sitting pretty, everything is plumb, it's great. You have your first meeting with investors. It goes like so-so. Um, you don't get a firm no, you don't get a firm yes or anything like that. And then after that, I think everybody knows where this is going. <laughs> Second investor meeting, start to look bad. Third, fourth, fifth. <laughs> It just like continues to get worse. You're like, oh man, like this is this is bad. This is really bad. And then you wind up in this stage where like you're you're sadder than you've ever been before. You know, how many people here can can uh, you know <laughs> reconcile their own feelings with this? All right. So it's very common. At any given point, when you meet 90% of the startups out there, 10% have just been funded and they're like, oh, this is great. 
Uh, and those are the stories that you hear over and over again, like a prime example right here, 90% are in the doldrums because you've gone through this process. And then there are kind of two different um, you know, avenues that I've seen many startups take. There's terminal decline where you kind of blame the system and you, know, you think that it's not fit for you. Or the other one is you take a pivot. Okay, and what the pivot looks like is you're not really rebuilding anything, you're reframing things. And most important pivot is actually just going back and re redoing your pitch deck. You know, you started the company for a reason. Uh, your friends and family were excited about it for a reason. Maybe they're customers, maybe they're patients. Um, there's all good reasons there. Often it's the narrative that you present to investors. All right, so the pivot that we're going to talk about today is really just about rebuilding the deck and then reformulating the company. And it's actually the lowest ask of all the pivots, uh, but I think it's actually the most meaningful. All right, so the key thing I think to good decks is that you don't have the right customer, all right? So is there anybody here that's uh, developing a therapeutic or a software solution? All right, so what, what's your customer? <laughs> okay, can, so, can somebody with a simple customer just shout, shout one out? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, yeah. So, whoever, oh, um, large company for customers that are generating petabyte size data. Hmm? Physician, okay, so physicians, prescribers. Okay, so who's your customer? Okay, so payers, hospitals for a sepsis product. Who are you guys trying to get money from? Okay, so they're non-dilutive funding um, to build the IP. You guys, who are you raising money from for both you guys? Okay, okay, so friends and family, angel investors. So in that case, your product, maybe your therapeutic, it may be your, your software and your customer in 10 years might be your doctors, might be your patients. Right now, your customer is the VC, it's the angels. You're selling your equity to them. So the nuanced market, you know, the conventional wisdom that you often hear people say is build your deck around your customer, right? Build it around the end user. That's not who you're selling your, your equity for. You're selling your equity to investors who are then hoping that somebody else comes and buys that equity from them. You know, they may be impact-driven investors, but at the end of the day, they're driven by financial returns, and you need to build a deck that encapsulates that for them. You know, it is important to end users, it's important to patients that you have a product that's meaningful, but ultimately, you're building a deck for investors, for the people that you're selling your equity to, and it's very important that you keep that in mind, you know, and that's been borne out over and over. Facebook, theoretically, we're the end users. But in reality, the end users are going to be marketing companies that are buying from Facebook. You know, for us, our, our customers right now, first it started out with angel investors, then it's VCs, and then it's pharma. Um, and so the nuanced market that you have is you're building your deck to sell equity to one customer, and that customer's goal is then to sell their equity to the next customer down the line. And if you think about a traditional therapeutic, you're never going to be around at the point at which you're actually selling your product to an MD, you know, or to a patient. So this is the whole goal of a successful deck is, you know, that customer that you're selling equity to, you're building your deck for eventual share sales or, you know, other strategics, everything like that. So I think this is when I see decks that have difficulty raising money, this is the most fundamental issue that I think I've seen over and over again. All right, and so this is my very first slide that I made when I went out and I was trying to raise money. I didn't get a single second meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, we have a very meaningful product for patients. It's for late stage cancer patients. We're seeking to have disease modification and to turn a three month diagnosis into a three to 10 year diagnosis or potentially another, you know, a, a new lease on life. 
And that was the story that I was trying to tell over and over again. And fortunately, New Jersey Health Foundation, a bit on that, they're very interested in the patients. Um, for many investors, especially in the current market, they need to know that, that there's going to be a downstream product. So we had some images. I tried to make the graphic more fancy. It, it never landed. What did land was just by saying, hey, we're in a therapeutic pathway that's been tried to be drugged before. Pharma, you know, Eli Lilly, Bristol Myers, uh, you know, Allergan, all these major players tried to drug this pathway. They failed. They gave up on it. We have a drug that drug can drug it. Then all of a sudden in our market, you know, our angel investors, our VCs know that there's a pharma down the road that has bought into this therapeutic idea and will then buy them out. We'll bail out their fund and then give them their, the IRR that they need. All right. And so now, so jumping into, you know, once you've got that vision, so that was the vision that I just put together, right? Your vision is to these VCs that you're raising money from. So they're, they're always doing that internal calculation of what risk is worthwhile. Um, you need to have a company that is more than just vision. they no side of vision. They didn't have team or execution. Um, I know they're a common punching bag these days, but it, it's for a good reason. They had a great vision. Right now, people are, are actually executing on that vision. But that's because these newer companies have a team that they paired with that vision. I think over and over, you'll find many funders will invest in a good team and a good vision because it roughly balances out the risk. Um, so that's a company like Calico. Uh, you know, They put together a great team, great vision, um, but they really didn't start out with much. And then the final thing when you're building the slides that really tips the scales is going to be adding in IP onto that side. So when you have a deck that you're selling for financing, these are the three core components of the deck. Everything else I'd say is just, you know, just sprinkles on the top. You know, all the flavors will be different, but this is what balances out the risk for you. All right. And so this was what our mission was. Um, this was a, a successful Series A uh, raising slide. Happy to go through these later. Um, just relaying at a high level what the vision is and what, um, you know, what the IP looks like and then what the team looks like. All right. And... This, sorry, this thing's going a little bit slow. And then finally, the last thing that I want to go through is just you know that, that risk and reward. Um, so the last piece of the slide deck is really conveying about how you're mitigating risk. So often people think that high risk equals high reward in venture. Uh, it's sort of the opposite. Your deck conveys that you're eliminating risk in a stepwise fashion. Um, and you want to do so by first getting rid of IP risk for them and then getting rid of operational risk. Good operational risk is mitigated through a good budget plan and a good team. And then the final thing is scientific risk or development risk, I think goes down at a pretty constant rate throughout product development. So there's not much that you can do right there, but getting rid of operational risk and IP risk in your slides early on is I think really critical to having the right, um, the right deck. And so if you put all these things together, um, your deck can look many different ways. It can be formatted in different ways, um, whatever. But you want to get rid of risk through the IP, through the vision, and then through the team in a way that's very clear, very tangible. Um, and then it makes it clear why somebody would eventually acquire your company or you'll successfully go through a Series B, Series A, Series B, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And so this is what our IP slide looked like. Um, this is what our team slide looked like. There's nothing fancy here. Um, I picked a unique hex color for the top, and that was about the only thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then here's what our operational plan looked like. It, it's simple stuff. It just needs to cover the, the tick boxes that investors need to see that mitigates each of those pieces of risk and then ties it together with a vision that they can believe in. We didn't do any customer metrics, market metrics. We didn't say this is a $100 billion market. Uh, people know that cancer is a big market. People know that AI is a big market right now. The goal of this deck is just to get you in the door for the second meeting, right? And that is the only goal of your primary financing deck is to get a call back and then go from an associate or principal into a VP meeting or into the, the investment board meeting. All right. And so I think that actually... Uh, ties everything out. Um, I was going to sort of leave everybody with this thought before we go into the discussion. 
is that um, you know the most successful VCs are the ones that have the most successful exits. They do it time and time again. So actually having the right investor team behind you, NJHF was really critical to us and then now our current Series A investors. What they do is they help to mitigate the scientific risk for us. You know, there's an incredible amount of failure. Um, you don't want that failure to come from operational risk or from a lack of capital. So having the right investors to bridge you, to help you on a down round, to guide you through difficult litigation, those are all the investors that you want on your team. Um, if you're going with unsophisticated investors in your space, uh, you need to be ready to deal with all of the non-scientific variables on your own. Um, and so, you know, we went with sophisticated investors. That's not right for everybody, um, but that's something that I always encourage you to take a chance at sophisticated investors in your space first, and then work with the unsophisticated investors later. And so with that, I've got this successful deck here that raised money. Um, we can click through that, I think, as the discussion uh, evolves. But from here, I'll, I'll sort of pass it over to Anne-Marie and Mike. Um, great. I, I want to um, toss a question to Mike here. So one of the things you said was that you should be creating your deck for your investor. Um, we're in the middle of an i cohort right now, which talks a lot about customer discovery. Mm -hmm. I know that we're out figuring out who that customer is. Um, it's a little bit different message what I'm hearing. Um, I want to ask, and I, I think they align, but I want to I want to ask Mike as an investor, um, what do you think about somebody coming to you with a deck, and and how do you want them to be pitching it to you as, as an investor with a market? I think just to step back, this program uh, uh, is that Mike working? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear know. me or no? No, I can get it. Yeah. How's that better? Yeah. Okay. J just to step back, because the, the point of this series was, you know, there's a lot of judgment and nuance, I think, that goes into all of this. Uh, there's plenty of great content out there on the web in terms of, you know, the, the 10 slides you should have and, and so on. But, you know, Mark sharing his specific experience and allowing some Q&A is what we're trying to get at. And so your point is, is, is right on the mark there, I think, Emery, in terms of the the, the nuance, what Mark, I think, was positioning is you're, this is a risk management exercise and you're selling how you're managing that to the investors that care about it. But also we're, what I'm going to try to respond to is there's multiple domains that we want to try to cover tonight as well, not just biotech and stages, right? So we're focused on really early stage and series A, but there can be, you know, series B and others. Um, what I would say is, Elements of that related to customer discovery are risk management, right? Do I know my customer? Are they going to purchase it? Um, these are critical issues for, say, like a software company, right? Maybe you're ready to launch your product. You're going to market with the money that your investor is going to deploy. That's a different situation than Mark is in. He's just de-risking the drug. He's, they want to make sure that the IP is going to be there, right? A lot of times there's a long lead time of development, and you need to have these barriers to entry on the life science side, a little bit more than say the fast mover strategy that you might have with just a pure software play. And in that case, we're gonna say, hey, here's a million dollars. Whose door are you gonna knock on and how quickly are we gonna start seeing customer dollars flowing back? So I think that's why a lot of you know, NSF on the physical science side as well, they're trying to make sure there's good alignment and people understand who their customers are. And, and that's just- the that customer and who's gonna pay? Who's gonna pay? Not always the same person. Well, I think right. that's a really good point. You know, Cross it over to a little bit more on the medical side. And we, we see this with therapeutics, but also on the medical device side, we, we, we say within that customer discovery quadrant, if you will, it's really stakeholders, right? And so there's patients, payers, providers. And to Mark's point, you typically just say customer, but you're selling other people, right? They all have kind of a vote, if you will. Um, and so understanding that multi-sided marketplace is I think the way Steve Blank refers to it, it's it's not um, self-evident to someone who maybe hasn't worked in that that field. So you gotta you know, do all those interviews with those different different right. stakeholders. And I do think that there's value instead of saying, well, I think this or that, saying when I spoke to the director of, she told me it, it brings different credibility to you, but also to your answer that that is not, I'm, I guess it's going to be, or I think it's going to be, but this person that I spoke to that would be the eventual person that's going to write the check or say yes or no 
told me this, right. um, which you are in a different space because you're so far removed from the actual final sale. Um, so it is very different, I think, with the therapeutic. Um, they're still going to want to know that there's a, a channel to get you to market, um, uh, but it'll be different than somebody who's working on a device or a software or, yeah. And if it's okay, what I thought I'd do just to get a little tactical, I'll buzz through a couple of slides that I typically would like to see, and I hopefully can pull out some nuance, right? Because they're not all supposed to be there, and it depends on the domain. And as Mark said, I think some of his slides, they, they weren't in there, but that doesn't matter because it depends on the team and what they're pitching as well. So it's not, it's not ironclad. And I think if you go out there and look on the web, you're going to see, you know, really talented and successful people with different opinion. And it's really the entrepreneur's job to take all that information in and then make a judgment themselves like Mark did. And he was successful with that. Um, so one of the things though, Mark mentioned about selling to the equity investors, I, and I think we may have mentioned this briefly in the first uh, session is just understanding who it is you are pitching. And Mark asked, who are you raising the money from? We heard angels, and I think there was some nonprofit, but is it a series A investor? And understanding what, what's their return outlook, right? How much are they going to want? Are, are you even within their return model, right? Are you going to generate returns that a venture capital fund would be interested in? What time horizon? Are you asking them, what fund are you going to invest in me out of? And, and when is that going to, you know, what's the time frame on and that? And what does that mean? So, so if I say to you, what fund are you investing? How do I know if I'm in your time model? So they would, I mean, if you ask that question, they'll be transparent and ask, they'll say, this is, you know, fund three, it has a vintage year of, you know, 2010. And so we're it's getting to and the what end. What does it matter to me? So if you're at the tail end and they're in this kind of harvest period, then there could be a situation where they're putting money in, but probably pushing for an earlier exit than what you as the founder and entrepreneur perceive your plan to be. And so that's where you just wanna have those early conversations. It doesn't mean it's a lock in that way, but just make sure you're aligned, right? So that alignment, and as, as Mark was saying, in terms of um, selling to the equity holder or the investor, just getting that alignment, I think, um, situated up front is important. Um, and then I, I also talk about the soft pitch and the hard pitch. So Mark, what he's talking about is really the hard pitch. I'm putting a deck in front of someone and I'm expecting, hopefully, a yes and funds to come back to me, an actual investment. But uh, there's also a concept of a soft pitch where you, it's a little bit like uh, Mark's explanation around friends and family. You're starting to put teaser decks out there or information out there to get feedback. And this is a lot of the customer discovery in i which is tremendously valuable. You're going to learn a lot about your deck, what's working, and just putting yourself on the radar. And then as you uh, execute and achieve milestones, you can come back to those folks for the hard pitch. But we've seen the soft pitch as a very effective tool to get on the radar, they'll start tracking you. You say, I'm gonna complete these three milestones in the next eight months. And when you do it, you have credibility and you have your own warm introduction. You made your own warm introduction. So, so if I was gonna to come to you with a soft pitch, what would I say to you? So two things in terms of say, one, I think the, the deck itself is usually a bit of a lighter touch, non-confidential, and you're just trying to get the opportunity in front of the investor. The other, um, and Kirsten, I think, has it in hers, she, she reminded me uh, today, is we talk about decks, but there's a cousin, I would say, and that's the executive summary. That two-page executive summary, people probably see these you know, various boxes. The way it's organized, it's just very easy to ingest information. It's not very data heavy, but if you want to just get a, a good glance at, hey, is this an opportunity I want to pursue? It's a great one. So um, if it's a soft pitch like that, you're like, team, technology, vision, what is it you plan to do? I think that's kind of the core. And then sometimes we've found, honestly, we go in for a soft pitch and all of a sudden they want more and more because the force field's down. They know, they tell them, well, I'm not here. I'm not raising money right now. We're going to be raising money in the next six to 12 months. They're open to listening. And if they like what they hear, they're going to say, well, you know what? We want to follow up with you. And it's amazing. Actually, the dynamic kind of, they start chasing you. So it is a very valuable tool. So just wanted to mention the, the soft pitch. We can get into it maybe in the Q&A if you want to know the different types of decks, whereas you know, Mark is pitching in a meeting with a VC versus maybe a deck you might send over the transom via email or leave behind that can't have to speak for itself. That might be structured a little bit differently. Um, the, Mark mentioned this at the top, but integrate a story. 
you know, and I think Mark, you, you have, there's other drivers, there's plenty of data, you know, we can talk about the opportunity, the product itself, but is, are there other attributes around the story and your vision? Why are you doing this? We have this happens many times. They'll pitch us. We'll go through all the way through the slide deck and then it's kind of winding down and you're trying to dig in, learn more about the person and like, oh, well, you know, my aunt had cancer and I was a young person and that really intrigued me and I wanted to, you know, make a, a difference in the world. And I, so I went to school for, you know, molecular biology and, and here I am starting this company. Well, it would have been nice to really know that on the front end because it does, it captures people's attention. And then the other words that are coming out along the way, they're, they're really listening, right? Because they know when the going gets tough, you're going to keep going because you have other motivations behind, you know, why you're doing that. So really use that story arc. And as human beings, we've learned through story forever, right? And so if you have a compelling story, you're going to capture attention. Um, and then just quickly, uh, cover page title with some contact information, ha have that. Um, the problem, like what is the unmet need? And Mark mentioned about, you know, he had a whole uh, table of big companies that had failed, you know, the undruggable target that he is now can drug. I mean, that is a compelling story. Um, and it's going to, I think, state the problem. There is a big problem. People have been working at it. They've been unsuccessful. We're going to be successful. So that like rolls into the solution. And, you know, Mark had, had that in his slide deck. But in terms of the solution itself, don't talk about it as like a widget. Talk about it in terms of solving the problem, because a lot of people, I think, do get hung up on that slide with, hey, it's a technological based product and they go deep into the technology and not focus a broader perspective on, on the solution. Um, the other in terms of the, the market and again, Mark didn't hit heavy. He knows it's a billion and most of his uh, investors know that. And I've heard actually very well known investors in their blog say, I know how much oncology is worth. Don't tell me. I would just say this is a way to read the room and this is nuance. You can have a deck and you can uh, a slide and you can just breeze right past it if you know that group knows it. But in terms of your deck, you know, it's a way to show is it a billion dollar market? And again, Mark's in the therapeutic space and oncology where it, there's no question. It's not, but we have medical device companies. We don't know what subsegment they might be in. And this gets back into the, the venture fund side. Do you have a market opportunity that is large enough for them? And that's why talking about the market, you know, establishes that for them if it's, if it's uncertain. In Mark's case, I think it's fairly certain. And the, to my point, there's a way to blow people out of the water when you have that first meeting with them is you have an appendix slide with the answer to the question they just asked. If you can predict it and then go straight to it, then that's like helps to seal the deal very quickly. And I think the appendix is important. I, I may get that to, to the end here. Um, so I hit market, barriers to entry. Mark already mentioned IP and especially in I think deep tech, biotech. IP patents, that is kind of the ultimate barrier to entry. There's usually a long development cycle. It's very capital intensive. They need to make sure that at the end of that equation, that there is going to be a monopoly, a barrier that they're going to be able to get paid back uh, for all that. In the software space, not so much. You know, Not to say that patents aren't important, but by the time you get your first office action, you may be in and out of business in some cases, right? So it's not as important, but then it's, it, it tips the other way. Um, if you're not going to have patents and big and high barriers to entry, then things like unit economics, go to market strategy. How are you going to move fast and execute? The, 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 that goes up, right? You're going to have to address that because you're going to have to move faster into market and generate revenue because you don't have these barriers. Um, competition. This is one probably people hear it. You, you, I've heard it. I don't have competition. Everybody has competition. The status quo, whatever it is, is the competition. And especially in new innovative technology, it may be horrible. The solution, the current you know, solution may be horrible, but moving people off that workflow or changing mind share, especially if it's been you know, in place for 20 or 40 or 60 years, that's very hard. So whatever the status quo is, that's the competition and how are you gonna overcome it? Um, so regulatory, this is one, on the therapeutic or medical device side, I like to know what regulatory regime we're operating in. Sometimes I put a star next to it. It may not have a lot of relevance at the stage of development you are, but in some cases it may have a lot. Again, in the medical device side, sometimes, oh, it's a 510K, it's not gonna cost anything. We're gonna be in the market in six months. And then when you really peel the onion back, you're like, no, actually that's not the case. And you're gonna have to have clinical trials to back this up. And it's gonna take a lot longer and tens of millions of dollars. So knowing, 
what, you know, what regulatory regime you're going to operate in. The other thing, it's a way for the team, if they know it very well, it's a risk management issue that, that Mark mentioned. And it shows that the team has thought about this thoroughly. So it's a way to kind of you know, get some points that, hey, we've diligenced this ourselves very well. We're going to be good stewards of your capital. We know what to do on Monday morning after you fund us. That comes um, back to the question, the point about not saying I think, but when I spoke to so-and-so at the FDA and I asked this question, or when I spoke to this regulatory consultant, what they told me was it, it brings your level up and right. reduces your risk. And, and I think there's, you know, you can use regulatory as a strategy or a mode as well. So, you know, if you have orphan designation or you can get breakthrough device designation, these things are valuable, you know, to the company and, and show that you have a unique product. So, you know, just investigate where your uh, indication or your device is going to fit within that regime. It's not all bad news. Like I have to overcome these burdens. It's, it can be good news and a strategic opportunity. So think of it in, in that way. Um, and then the economic model, again, I think in Mark's case and the biotechs generally, they're, you know, they're going to go public and take this all the way, or they're going to exit to a large pharma. It's fairly straightforward. And most of the folks he's talking to understand that. The, the one thing I would say is, um, and I think Mark touched on this, is this pitch deck going only to investors or also to strategic partners, like in life sciences? And the more I think you understand their business model and that your solution fits into their portfolio uh, could, can be helpful. Again, I'm going to pivot now back onto the software side or high tech or other domains, that economic model, you may need to know much more about that, right? And demonstrate that you really understand how you're going to go to market, how are you going to generate revenue? The, the burden is a lot higher if I'm going to put a million dollars in and you can get to market in you know, under a year. So you just, again, another nuance, know what market you're in and what the expectations would be for that market. And that's really a diligence matter for the entrepreneurial you know, team to, to know that. Um, the team is an important one. Um, financials, if it's relevant, you know, it could be too early for, for some to have a full-blown financial plan. But you know, even in the therapeutic space, your strategics or your potential acquirers, they are definitely running financial models on this potential drug. And so they're going to be understanding how much it might be worth. So the, the more um, understanding you have on that, the better you're going to be in terms of negotiating, you know, sub licenses or upfront fees, uh, exits, wh whatever it might be. Um, I'm just at the end here. And we can open it up for discussion. Uh, so don't forget to make an ask. What, was, what do you want out of this? Like, I am raising X dollars. If you want to talk about the terms, you can. It could just be, but, but make an ask. And then how are you going to use the funds? Um, I think that's also another way to distinguish yourself from other teams to say, look, we've really thought about this. And I know Mark had this in his pitch decks and he put a lot of time into the operational side. And like you said, it's a way to manage risk from the investor side. You're like, wow, we're going to put this money with those folks and we trust what they're going to do with it. We agree with their operational plan. So, you know, use it, get some, get some points out of it, but make the ask and how are you going to use the funds? A lot of people don't ask. It's amazing, actually. They go through all this information and they don't make a request of funds or an investment. Um, then I have, I put a star next to this because I've seen it used effectively, but I, again, you can, I've seen a summary slide used effectively in some cases. So at the end of the presentation, especially for later stage, more developed companies where they have like all the milestones they've achieved, if they're generating revenue, the power of their team, issued IP, they just put all the, the total value proposition as a summary slide, and then they just end it there. Yeah. And it's in here somewhere. He has keep, it. Keep talking. Yeah. And so then when you're in the meeting, that slide just sits there and it's just talking for you the whole time. So it, it sometimes it depends on, you know, you'll get a feeling yourself of whether it's going to work or not. And then I usually end with, again, a contact information slide. So you can have it, hit it and go back to the summary slide or leave it at the contact information slide. Um, but again, these are kind of a, a high level list. The individual founder and an entrepreneur has to make the decision of you know, what they want to select. And I would encourage you to go out to the web, you know, like TechCrunch does teardowns of pitch decks. There's a lot of opinions out there on which particular uh, uh, set of slides you should have. This is more about like the nuance. And then I just want to underscore the point that Mark made around the appendix, especially for deep tech, biotech, hard tech, whatever term you want to use. The ones that require a lot of data to convince people, this is a, a read the room issue too. Don't push all that data up front into the main body of the deck. 
um, definitely have some data in the main body of the deck, but then the, the, the investor will take you from there. They may want to deep, deep dive. And then like Mark said, you can go right to the appendix and talk about data for the rest of the meeting if you want to. But there's other people that will say, you know what? I am going to diligence this thing. I'm trusting what you show me is going to work out. I'm going to move through the rest of the deck and we'll diligence this later. So don't get hung up on the data. And I think a lot of people, they, they are so proud of their data. They are they're super excited and it is exciting, but let them kind of take you where they want to and you will have an opportunity to prove to them that this works. And I mean, Mark, maybe you can talk about the diligence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the way that I'd say you build the appendix is you go into your first meeting with no appendix. Uh, the questions that you get asked, those are the appendix slides that you have the next time. And then you just do a rounding average over time. The slides that you go through in the main pitch, when you get glassy eyes or no questions on those, those go to appendix, all right? So your deck evolves after every single presentation. Um, and then you just take the sum of the responses and then build it that way. And you'll often find that people tend to have convergent thinking and that builds you the most efficient deck by the time you get 10 pitches in. That's all I had on, on that. I wanna talk a little bit about how to uh, figure out which investors to pitch and how to manage your records, your, your, um, your spreadsheets around who is in that sweet spot, who's too late, who's too early, um, who invests in your area, um, who uh, you know, has a good reputation for an, how, how to manage that whole process. Yep, so um, you can do it two ways. One is if you know somebody who's within the industry who has been pitching, they'll have their own records um, and say you had a company that rhymes that you know well, they can tell you who they pitched with, who the associates were, and then provide you with three to four intros, maybe maximum. But they'll give you that prioritized list that you can seek out during future pitch events or just have cold outreach. We, we actually did quite a bit of cold outreach. And as long as it's in their therapeutic focus, like the associates at most firms will review everything and they'll email you back if it's something that's interesting. The other way is to go into similar companies. You know, if you know that there's a competition or an adjacent company, see who they raised financing from. Um, and that's often at least your first look at it. What, what I often found is actually a VC or an angel that doesn't invest um, in your company will then be open to investing in similar companies in the future. So say VCA invested in this adjacent company you reach out to that VC, they're like, hey, we're going to pass on this. It's too close to what we're doing. But here are three others that I know have been looking in the space. And they actually all share between them. It's, it's a very cohesive and tight community. And you'll find a lot of sharing between those different groups. So actually, don't be afraid to go hop from one investor to the others. They know who each other are looking for. Um, and then I think the one thing that's most difficult to suss out is actually which, which funds have inactive investment phases and they're just looking at things to keep busy but aren't actually serious that's the most difficult one time and time again maybe that they're they're at the end of their fund or they're not fundraising you won't get a clear answer from them because they don't want to you know shut the door on you um, and they'll keep it open you're just not certain like where it's going so many different routes i'd say going within the industry that you're in is a good way to do it i found at least in biotech it's very friendly and it's easy to sort of make the rounds from within rather than being worried about too, being too cagey. I'll just mention we're an impact investor. So, you know, a little bit different than, you know, pure play VC where, you know, we're looking at our mission as a, as a deliverable or ROI. And so I would say, depending on who you're approaching, again, strategics versus traditional VC versus an impact investor or even other nonprofits or family offices, I think, um, even family offices, I think, sometimes have mandates or they're focused on particular problems. And so you'll the pitch to them can be different. If you can get your you know, finger on that pulse of what is it that drives them beyond the return, I mean, the return typically has to be there as well, but that's a, another way to, to craft your pitch or, or tailor the pitch uh, a little bit different than, say, a traditional uh, VC pitch. And then in terms of how you find these people, there's also proprietary databases. There's things you can grab off of the internet. I would just say, as Mark said, you know, good entrepreneurs are able, I think, have a pretty good hit rate in even cold outreaches if it's well-informed. I mean, if, you, if you've done research on the fund, and nowadays everyone has a website, um, but with even just you know, 
TechCrunch and, and, and you know, PitchBook and some of these other proprietary databases, there's a lot of information. And so if you put a well-crafted email together, it's in their space, as Mark said, the, the associates, this is their, their job to build a pipeline. You should have a good, a good hit rate. The other is service providers. If you, you know, if you have lawyers, accountants that, you know, they're kind of niche spaces. So they've had a practice for 20, 30 years, whatever it is, they're going to be connected. They probably represent some of these venture funds. And so they're also a very good trusted resource to put you in touch with a, a particular fund. And, you know, you can add all those up together and kind of vector into the right person and then, you know, prioritize them and then go after them. And I know, you know, Mark, we, we said this the last time, but there is a process, you know, you know, build that process, customize it to how you like to work and then run the process. I'm going to ask, you want to have? Yeah. Uh, one other thing in all this startup space, you're going to find a lot of pro bono um, work, people that have done it that want to get, share and give back because they got pro bono work. Find somebody like that that has been in it for a long time. You'll find a lot of people willing to mentor and give back in that way. So Princeton has a huge community in it. Um, you should be able to find it all over of people willing to do those introductions and who believe in your mission. I'm going to ask one, I hope it's a quick question, and then we'll open up to the audience, both in the room and online. Um, uh, what is an immediate no? What would, uh, you know, you get a deck, a deck that's spun over to email to you, and you open it up, and you're like, uh-uh. <laughs> Uh, so for us, I mean, it's just, it's not in our investment paradigm. I mean, and we get them, I get them every day. I mean, it's, um, I'm not going to do a franchise, you know, or, I mean, just, they, it, th that's what I mean about the diligence and the, the, um, the research, because it's clear, it breaks through, um, people are reading their emails and you can tell if someone's just spamming me, you know, just throwing, oh, let's see if it hits versus someone who, I went to your website. I saw that you've invested in Kaothera. Like it just jumps off the page. So it's not a ton of work, but it is work. But hey, you know this is this you're in competition. You got to put in some work. Um, so I would just say that. And I think for other VCs, especially because their websites, they're like our investment thesis is pretty clear. Um, you totally missed the mark. You know we don't invest in medical devices. <laughs> you know why are you reaching out to us? So so you know that that's one. Yeah, we had a list of maybe 40 people that we were interested in chatting with. Um, I reached out to about 25 of them. About half of those were cold emails. And, and our hit return rate was 100% on those. Maybe we had one or two that would dropped off because I didn't have the right email address. Uh, but like my, Mike said, and especially if you tailor it, like your first slide is, you know, something towards their fund or something towards their investment thesis that shows you just change the first page, that it makes a big difference. It comes back to what we were talking about last time around creating your um, your data bank, your and uh, and doing your research ahead of time, doing your work ahead of time before you ever reach out to anybody, and making sure you have done your diligence as much as they're going to do their diligence, and making it easy for them. I, I think that's sort of coming back to yeah, the same. Yeah, I mean, I just know I can see it. I, I can see it from the very early pitches. Because if you say yes, the follow-up, it comes really easy. And then you'll see, you can tell these decks have been scrubbed, that they're good decks. They've survived first contact. Um, so everything that Mark's saying, you know, you, you build that process and, and execute it. And I think the recipients on the other end, when you run that process in a disciplined manner, they can feel it. You, you, really, you can tell the difference. And that's why we, we in our portfolio, we encourage all, all of our companies to do these things. And, I remember back in the day doing two different deals when I'm diligencing them. And again, I think I mentioned before, but a flood of emails versus this is back in the day, like a zip drive, you know, one folder, everything there, like which, which deal is going to get done quicker, do you think? And so everyone can feel that when you have a prepared team and it just inures to your benefit because it shows this is the way you're going to operate your business. This is the way the team, you know, goes about moving the technology forward. So it's not rocket science. I'll open it up to audience questions. I have others if the audience doesn't have any. Here you go. Mike and Mark, Anne Marie, all of you, thank you so much. And uh, it was very informative. My question is very simple it is on valuation. Let's say you have a startup 
Uh, it is a product that is very brand centric. Let's say it's not a consumer product per se, but it falls in that space. It's very brand centric, which means your investment requirement is majority, 80% devoted to spending branding money, right? The product is proven in that space. Uh, there are some innovations that you have made. And how do you get around the valuation of the business that you're proposing? Because if you go by the traditional model, it could be one tenth of what you're actually looking at. Let me just restate it. So you're saying that there's like an underlying technology, but this particular opportunity, there's some unique value to the brand you believe, and you're trying to capture value out of that unique brand proposition? Valuation of the business itself. I said it's a 80, $80 billion, $80 billion plus per year. That sale. Investors will go through that number traditional. Right? Yeah. Because when you come into very brand specific businesses, valuation of the company is based on the brand value more than just product selling by the turnover. Um, so you're saying um, for early stage companies yes. where there's no established brand, it's all projections. Exactly. How do you value those companies? Right. Okay. So um, is, you know, you've probably heard the term that it's art and science, right? So the earlier you are on that curve, it's more art than science. Now you can use all kinds of tools of financial modeling to try to support and make it more science than art, but, and you should do that, right? And so there's comparables, um, there's, there's pro forma modeling you can do, but it's all based on assumptions. And again, the earlier you are, that could be 90% assumptions, right? Or more. So how much water is that going to hold in terms of that argument? But you should do the work and try to substantiate. Then it usually comes back to, you might have a comparable, and then it's what is someone worth uh, willing to buy, right? It comes down to a negotiation in the earliest stages. And as you move up and get closer to making those comparables real, if you have revenue and this kind of cash flow, it, it, it can move closer to the, to the science. But in the earliest stages, really, it's all based on assumptions. Um, you, you're gonna have to negotiate what a, a fair valuation will be at that. And, and I don't know if Mark wants to comment on, but I think a lot of comparables come into that point. I, at its simplest, it's how much they're willing to pay you for it, right? Like every investor is going to have an amount of money they're comfortable putting in and an amount of ownership they need to get out of their investments. So there's going to be a range there, but there's going to be a, a limit to their upper value. And you're trying to just take their lower limit and drive it towards where the upper limit is. So if you have two different term sheets or two different investments, it's easier to get to the upper side. If you only have one person that's made it through with a yes, you're gonna wind up on the lower side of that range. Um, and you need to figure out what is it worth to you to say no? Um, and that's the valuation that you're gonna walk away with. And I'll, I'll say too, they're, they're also looking at what's their total amount of capital they're gonna to have to put into this business. So you know, understanding you know, what the future rounds might be, like how much capital you're gonna to have to raise over the life of this opportunity. And so they're, they're calculating that. So typically it's like a third, it might be a third upfront that you're talking about, but they're probably reserving you know, another two thirds for, for follow on. So that's a, a calculus that they're making as well. And so as Mark said, they know at that stage, say the, you know, seed or, or, or series A that they need X percentage of the company and they anticipate, you know, putting Y dollars in over the lifetime of this opportunity before they exit. So, so that we started off, I think in the first session to just understanding the broad venture economics that will help, I think, align you with the investor because I'm assuming that they're going to know a lot about this field and probably the, the domain you're in. So to Mark, they already have in their mind probably what, what they're willing to pay. So a follow-up question real quick. Follow up on the valuation. So um, early stage, pre-seed, um, medical device, same discussions around valuation. So I appreciate everything you said, but do you include that in your deck? Some, it seems like I get that from angel investors and then we're already negotiating before we even gotten to the next step. So any advice on how do you handle the valuation when you're, when you're still pitching? It's like, wait, we're gonna negotiate that anyway. So why are we having this conversation? But I don't wanna actually say that, but I'm getting to that point. 
I would put it high enough that you don't scare them off, but it gives you a first stake in the sand is what I would say. You know, that I didn't put it in the deck, but that was often the question, you know, what valuation are you pitching on? Um, if, if you come in at 120 million for a pre-seed, then, you know, you're not going to get a second meeting. So it needs to be high enough that you, you can negotiate down, but not so high that you won't get a second meeting. Is that a good quality? The question there, uh, like valuation as a key. Yeah, well, when the conversation starts from valuation, but then when you talked about uh, what amount of funding at what point of time that we are looking at, the conversation goes into something like where my business is more into contract manufacturing when I'm leveraging the contract manufacturing model, but the investors are more looking at, I would like to see stuff. So when are you gonna put your own manufacturing unit at what point of time, et cetera, et cetera. So the conversation then goes into two different directions because you don't want to be capital intensive seeking more and more money in a, in a brand centric product, right? So that's where any amount of guidance from you would really help. Was that a comment or a question? I'm not sure I got. I, I think we could probably visit this. In the, yeah, yeah, maybe go the, offline. Yeah. And I, I have a couple of online questions. The first is, um, do you recommend sending a deck before the first investor meeting? And if so, what kind of deck? And if you recommend to not send the deck? And the investor insists what techniques are best to avoid providing a deck before the meeting. Um, yeah, I, th I think that sending it beforehand is okay. I always prefer to send it afterward, but obviously you need to send enough materials to get your foot in the door. Um, so in my mind, it's the, it's the you know, short elevator one that Mike mentioned. It's enough to get them enticed, not so much to introduce any potential, say, liabilities that you're not there to explain in person. So if there's a very clear competitor um, to what you're doing and it, that requires a voiceover, you probably don't want to include that slide in there, but high level vision and then some IP de-risking stuff that's relatively innocuous, this sort of expounds on what you have in the website. Um, I think that's good. And then always follow up with slides afterward. And again, I always watermark it with the group that I'm sending it to, um, shows a personal touch. And then also if it gets shared, you know who it's been shared from. I'll just uh, do a couple more and then we'll go back to the audience. Uh, what are the typical number of personal references that VCs ask founders to provide for due diligence? I don't know that I know of a typical number. Um, I think back in the day, we were doing like at least three uh, reference calls, like with their previous kind of employer management. Um, Did you guys reference me? No, no. <laughs> I you, think so. you had the uh, Yibin Kang uh, stamp of approval, um, but but in previous stops, whereas I yeah we did active diligence on the management teams, um, and it's it's usually like a like a like a handful because within that you, you know you know within three you, you, the red flag is up or not, um, and if you want to go deeper on particular issues or further numbers, you can. But I don't think there is a magic number. It's just trying to be, you know, thoughtful and making sure you you understand who it is you're going to be investing in. And uh, finally, from Keith Wang, Nick Rauschenbusch posted a detailed strategy for a seed round by progressively escalating safe cap, bringing in institutional investors halfway through, and sticking to stated deadlines. Does that sound doable? He's he's looking to raise through a safe that has an escalating valuation cap tied to a set of milestones? Is that, was that the question? Uh, I think so. It's, that's, that's the gist of the question. Yeah, it, it's, they're so um, fact specific. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, if you, if you need the capital, the, the golden rule, you know, he who has the gold, gold makes the rules. Um, it seems like a potentially reasonable approach as they're achieving, the, the cap goes higher. And I know there's one lawyer who was really getting down on, on safes that were far, financings over two to three million. Um, so that's a tool really early on when you don't want to spend on legal, but safes are not there to cover you when you're in a, a eight million, $10 million company. You just don't have the contract language that you need in a safe um, to help protect preferred shares, liquidation rights, founder protections, board seats, everything else. So I'd say that there's a limited role for safes 
to a certain point. Obviously, they're great in the seed round. A Series A um, with an escalating safe that allows institutional investors to come in, I think they're going to want those preferred shares, um, they're, they're, especially in the current macroeconomic cycle. Yeah, thank you both. I have a question for both of you because I think you'll have a different perspective. Um, so early stage startup and a seed or pre-seed round, what is your preference uh, versus experience in type of investment um, you would offer or take? Is it equity, convertible note or safe note? Maybe you'll just highlight a little bit about each. What do you want to go? Uh, I think that the standard right now um, is probably equity first, um, you know, safe, and then the convertibles last. Um, it's nice not to have loans on the book that are going to convert during your next financing round. Just makes the, the cap table a little bit more wonky when you're negotiating it. But I'd say that all of them are pretty innocuous at the seed round. You know, everybody's, VCs have seen all of those and can deal with them at a legal level. Um, obviously more complex loans and venture debt and things like that are probably not ones that you want to incur early on just because it, it makes things complicated. I think it's um, kind of all of the above, but at the seed stage, uh, seems like the safe has you know, gained a ton of traction, but there's probably groups and individual angels who've you know, been operating with convertible debt for a long time and they're just comfortable with it. And so you got to go with that if that's what if that's what they want to do. Uh, definitely, those seed is gaining traction or has traction um, fully in that seed stage. Um, and then as you get to Series A, to Mark's point, I think the VCs are all just going to do price rounds. So it's just going to be equity. And if there's if there's uh, safes or convertible in there, they'll get you know converted and cleaned up you know in that round. Yeah, my question about. Um... Uh, sophisticated investors, uh, does it change where you are, pre-seed, seed, series A, B? And how often do we need to see updated list of sophisticated investors? Um, so one, so a classic, very sophisticated investor was Google in the Calico space. Um, what we saw, at least in uh, 2019, 2020, is that sophisticated investors were only investing seed in Series A in megastar teams. So George Church, Jennifer Doudna were on those teams, right? Um, companies that were really technology and IP focused first, those were often going to more um, angels, to smaller groups, uh, mission focused groups. Um, it was only when you had a really blockbuster team. That being said, you know, there's a lot of examples of these that have been funded by Orbamed, that have been funded by Third Rock, uh, by Sequoia or Andreessen. So I think it depends on your mix. If you're going to raise with institutional investors at a seed round, your valuation is going to be a series A valuation. It's, it's going to need to be a, a 20 or 30 million pre-money in order for you to see, you know, eventual returns at the end. Otherwise your, your percentage is going to be really small. So I, my preference is probably for smaller mission focused ones where you're taking smaller amounts of money rather than those 20, $30 million pools that were happening in 2020, 2021. Um, can you repeat the question? Sophisticated? Or? Yeah, sure. That'll do. Um, how do you know, like, uh, what's your recommendation of understanding who's your sophisticated investor based on your stage? Like I'm a startup company at pre-seed, seed, series A, B. How do I know? How do we be mm. cognizant about, about sophisticated investors so that I can restrict reaching out to not a broad base, but- Okay. Yeah. So I think you're, you're trying to distinguish between sophisticated and unsophisticated. Is that the yeah. term? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think whether, they're, I mean, whether their performance is good or not, if you're doing a uh, series A on, you're likely a professional investor. You've raised a venture fund. You have limited partners. This is your day job. This is what you do for a living. Their performance may vary, but I would call them, and I think they would all say that they are all sophisticated investors. Um, below that, in that seed and below pre-seed, that's where you start to see a little mix of both professional venture capital funds operating, but then impact investors, 
um, angel investors. So, but once you get to, I think, Series A and on, these are all professionals deploying capital for a specific return and they do that for a day job. And I'd also say if they build a development plan for you, then they're pretty sophisticated. That's that's one of the key things. You'll probably come to them with a budget and then they'll come right back to you with a budget. They're like, no, scratch yours. Here's here's how you want to develop based on what you told us. And then you you work back and forth with that. And also if they've led a syndicate um, in the space, that's another common one. If you see people who are always following on, um, then they may be, you know, this may just be part of their investment thesis and they won't really dig in. So lead investors are ones that develop a budget and development plan for you. Yeah, I'll turn it a little bit to get away from sophisticated versus unsophisticated, be maybe um, more experienced and aligned. So, you know, you could reach out to a lot of venture funds and you might be getting a yes or an interest, but there's going to be some funds that are going to really be perfect fits for you, right? Because maybe the general partner or you know, the general partner team, um, someone in the fund just knows the space. They may have come out of the space. There, it's gonna be, you know, Mark after he exit Kathera. And and you you would really want to connect with them and get funding from them because you know they're just gonna be like rocket fuel. They're gonna just amplify the core team. So those would be the types of investors that that I would target, ones that really are gonna know your space, gonna really add value. So beyond the capital they deploy. You know, the term we use at our place, we call it operational capital. They're going to deploy a lot of operational capital and really push you that much further. I mean, someone else could provide the same amount of money, but they're not going to, you know, propel you as far. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm going to uh, wrap it up. I wanted to talk a little bit about events that are coming up. Um, we have the Entrepreneurship Council has a number of events. Um, uh, and also there's a French community event. Laurent, do you want to start by talking about the French community one? Yeah, okay. So on uh, uh, Thursday, this Thursday in Princeton, there will be uh, an event for around French entrepreneurs from uh, New York City to Philadelphia. All are welcome. Um, it is, there'll be a number of uh, different French groups talking. A lot of the conversation will be in French and English is also welcome. Uh, if you're interested in attending, please speak to Laurent if you want to lift your hand here. Okay, good. Most of the conversation will be in English. Phew. <laughs> uh, and then I want to talk about a few things that we have coming. April 13th in New York City, we have a Tiger Talks on Innovations and Material Science. Uh, that is this Thursday. That is both in person in New York City as well as virtual. Um, we have our Empower Conference coming up April 26, 27, and 28. It is celebrating women academic entrepreneurs. It is for everybody. Uh, but our celebration is specifically around women academic entrepreneurs. The conversation about starting, funding, and scaling companies is the same. Uh, there are some nuances, though. Um, that is all online, virtual, uh, except for the pitch competition, which will be in person in New York City for investors only, by invitation only, and the audience can watch live stream. Uh, nice big cash prize, $100,000 for first place, um, enough to hit a milestone. Uh, we have an Elevating Your Pitch Storytelling Workshop in New York on May 10th in the city. And we have, and that is in-person only, no remote. And we have our uh, conference during reunions. Uh, Princeton Reunions is for alumni, but the conference itself is for any and everybody. That is on May 26th, in person, on campus. You can find our events at entrepreneurs.princeton.edu. And if you want more information about the French event, there is a flyer on the when you walked in there on the desk, and you can talk to Laurent or myself. And I want to say a huge, and there will be a, a third of the entrepreneur's journey. We have to set the date. Um, so feedback from you guys. Michelle does send uh, some uh, an email out to you asking for feedback. We read it. We, we pay attention to it. Um, so please give us that feedback. And a huge thank you to Mark and Mike for once again coming and talking with us. And the, the bar and the, uh, for those in person, uh, the bar, the drinks, and the food is available. And for those online, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you.